how do we know that the books that we have in our Bible are the correct books? How do we know that books that should be in there uh, uh, weren't uh, left out or, or that books that we have in there should have been left out? We're going to talk about canon today in uh, Trust the Bible. And let me begin with just a, a common social media post that, that you may see, something like this at least. And this one says, How You Got Your Bible. And it says, Constantine and his bishops voted a bunch of books as the Word of God, 325 AD. And, and so the implication is, and as you go and, and read, it's, it's sort of some politicians were in a dark room somewhere, and they were picking and choosing which books they thought would, would help uh, them for political reasons or for whatever power reasons they were going for, and they slapped together books to put in what we call the Bible. And therefore, we should be very skeptical about the books we have in the Bible and, and maybe need to look at other books that were written in ancient times and, and consider them. That's what I'm going to address. I don't think this is at all historically uh, accurate, but we need to understand how we got the books of the Bible. And so this is called canon. Uh, the books, the specific list we have, 66 books in our Protestant Bible, is, is called the canon. Not canon, C-A-N-N-O-N, -N, but canon, C-A-N-O-N, which just means the basic rule or guideline measuring stick, if you will, of what should and shouldn't be in the Bible. Uh, in this video, I'm going to focus on the Old Testament canon. We have 39 books in our Old Testament, uh, 27 books in the New Testament. There is some dispute uh, about some books that were written in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So I'm going to focus on that today, the New Testament, uh, in the next video. All right, well, one of the things we need to know about how we got our Old Testament canon is that there are uh, 24 books in the Jewish canon. Uh, the Jewish people, the Israelites, are the ones that wrote our Old Testament. Their list has 24 books. Now, you say, well, that's a lot shorter than, than our list of 39. Well, not really. It's just that they number them differently. For example, we have a first and second kings. They just have kings. Uh, th we have 12 different minor prophets that end out the Old Testament. They put that all in one book. And, and so it's the same set of material or books, if you will, they just number them differently. And they were putting together this list sometime between 165 BC and 90, uh, or AD 90. And I say sometime between because scholars debate this, we're really not sure. There is some evidence that the entire list of what we now have of 39 books was recognized as these scriptures by the Jewish people possibly as early as 165, certainly by 90 uh, in, in AD 90, we know that they had this list, and, and somewhere in, in there, and certainly this would mean that Jesus' uh, teaching ministry of around 30 AD uh, is going to be um, in a time period where this list had already been put together, maybe not accepted by all Jewish people at the time, but certainly there were many Jews in his time that, that held to this list. All right, their list was divided into law, Sometimes it was simply called law. Genesis through Deuteronomy, the books of Moses. The prophets, um, that would include books like Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, and the writings. That would be books like Psalms, and it would also include in the writings First and Second Chronicles, maybe some books we wouldn't necessarily in our minds put in that category. Um, but these were the three categories they would use. Um, Josephus, uh, was a Jewish historian in the first century, and, and Jewish rabbis of that time in the following centuries said that books could not be inspired beyond the time of Artaxerxes, which would be right around 400 B.C. That's significant because that means that books written later, for example, um, other books we're going to talk about in a moment, the Apocrypha, like First and Second Maccabees, that is in the Catholic Bible, According to Jewish people in the first century, those books could not have been inspired um, by God. So that's, that's the Jewish background to the Old Testament canon. And other evidence of this is in the book of 1 Maccabees itself. And you say, what is 1 Maccabees? This is a book describing the story of Hanukkah. I believe it has a great deal of historical accuracy. Uh, there are some good truths and things to learn from it. It is in the Catholic Bible. It is not in the Protestant Bible. 
and I'll come back and talk about why that is later. But 1 Maccabees 9, verse 27 says, So there was great distress in Israel, such as had not been since the time that prophets ceased to appear among them. Now, this is written around 160 B.C., and what it's saying is that at this time, it had been a long time since God had prophets speaking. Well, that's a problem. How is Maccabees inspired by God if there were no prophets actively prophesying the Word of God? How could this be the Word of God if there were no prophets at the time? So this is, this is beginning to lay the groundwork of why Jewish people said the end of the canon came around 400 B.C. Um, with uh, those 39 books. All right, what did Jesus say about this? Well, there are several times where Jesus makes reference to these categories. In Matthew 7, 12, Jesus says, Do to others what you would have them do to you, for this sums up the law and the prophets. And you'll see Jesus often refer to the entire Old Testament with these two categories, law and prophets. Some Jewish people did not add that third category, writings, uh, until later on. But Jesus also refers to all three categories in Luke 24, verse 44. Jesus says, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And so he, he refers to a, a three-part division of the Old Testament that would correspond to our 39 books. Matthew 23, 35 Jesus says, uh, speaking to the religious leaders, he says, Upon you will come all the righteous blood that has been shed on earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah. Now you say, who, who is Zechariah? You may know Abel, of course, the first one murdered in uh, the Bible in Genesis chapter 4, murdered by Cain. So his blood was shed at the beginning of what we would call the Old Testament, Genesis Zechariah is the last prophet murdered right at the end of 2 Chronicles. And that's significant because in the Jewish ordering of books in the first century, 2 Chronicles was actually the last book in their canon, in their Old Testament. They had the same 39 books as us, but they numbered them differently, they ordered them differently. And Zechariah, his murder is recorded right near the very end of 2 Chronicles. And so Jesus is saying that the canon, according to him, is from Genesis all the way till the end of the Old Testament. Um, it, you're going to be held accountable because you've joined with them. And it's a way, I believe, Jesus is identifying that although there might have been some debate among different rabbis of the time as to which book should be included, Jesus held to that view of the list of 39 books that we have in our Old Testament today. All right, what about the Apocrypha? What about some of these books that come that were written after 400 BC and prior to the time of Jesus' ministry? What should we do with those? Well, the term Apocrypha means doubtful, and it shows that early church fathers, that is, the early Christians, the leaders of the Christian church after the time of Jesus, had doubts about these books. They saw them as helpful. Um, they had different views. Some thought we shouldn't read them at all. Some thought they were great. Even some argued that they should be scripture, but there was a lot of debate um, about them. Um, there's little evidence that there was widespread acceptance of them at any time um, as scripture. Augustine is the first, uh, writing in the 400s AD, is the first significant church uh, father to say they should be included. But many others, even in his time, argued against them. Jerome, for instance, was a, a very important uh, early church father who translated the Bible into the Latin Vulgate that would be used for centuries, and he did not include the Apocrypha in the Bible. He did not feel that they were part of Scripture, uh, along with many other church fathers. Um, the Roman Catholic Church uh, added these books, like First and Second Maccabees and a few others, um, to their canon, to their list of books, in 1546. So that is a very late time. Uh, it is not that they said they should be included in the Bible for the first time. They, it is that they had debates up until this time as to whether or not they should be included. Early church fathers said no. Over time, there were more that said yes. And the Catholic Church in 1546 says, okay, we're going to officially say they should be included. The problem is that this comes much later 
Um, it comes after the Protestant Reformation. Martin Luther begins protesting against certain Catholic teachings beginning in 1517. And so this council in 1546 is really a response to the Protestant Reformation, and it is in order to support their view of, of teaching against the Protestant view. Uh, it would be, um, they could make a better case, I think, for including these if it wasn't so clearly in order to strengthen their argument against Protestants, if it had had more to do just simply with historical reasons for including them. I don't believe they should be included they were never included officially until 1546 by um, the Catholic Church or the Protestant Church. Um, and Jesus, again, from what we looked at, supports the list that we have in our Protestant Bibles of 39 books. Well, next time we'll look at the list of books, the 27 books we have in the New Testament, and see how we came up with that list of books.